Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to this panel discussion. Now I see it in, in the, us in the live stream also, so I got the confirmation. Wonderful. Hello, welcome to this panel discussion about open source in enterprise on this OwnCloud conference 2021. My name is Markus Fallner, and I will be your host on this panel discussion, which will uh, be running until about 4.30, and we will discuss open source in enterprise and about lessons from the real world. And I'm, I'm very happy and I'm very thankful to OwnCloud that I have the chance of host, hosting this panel with such a brilliant uh, composition of uh, friends and experts. And uh, this is a very, very big uh, chance for me. Thank you very much. I like this a lot. So I want to welcome uh, everybody on in stage and in the internet also. Please post your questions. Don't hesitate. Post them in the, in the chat on uh, the stage, on Venueless events, on the link. And uh, while we, 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 I will try to keep an eye on that and answer your questions or trans or bring your questions into this panel anytime soon. And uh, let me first introduce this panel to you. Um, let's start with um, Alberto. He is on the top, uh, no, on the lower right. Alberto Pace is the head of storage at CERN. He is professor and professor at the University of Lausanne. Hello, Alberto. I will give the word for to everybody after I do the short round of introduction to 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 tell yeah the big audience what you're doing why you are here and what is your understanding of open source in the enterprise why you're in this panel discussion at all yeah so left of um, Alberto is uh, yeah I guess a well known face also in the the open source and in the own cloud world hello holger durov general manager of own cloud very warm welcome to you as well and uh, up on the left is klaas freitag also own cloud klaas is the cto of own cloud and uh, yeah very warm welcome to you and on the top right is cornelius schumacher <laughs> cornelius schumacher is the open source steward at deutsche bahn systel hello cornelius i'll say just a few words to to myself and then i hand over to the panel members my name is markus fallner i'm an open source journalist and yeah i i also am running my own company in regensburg i'm doing open source uh, pr for open source projects and i'm writing documentation and all that i do is basically focused on the open on the oz layers 8 9 and 10 so i am focusing very much on humans in open source and humans in in it and um yeah as a such and as a journalist i've been working at for linux magazine and heise ix as a deputy editor in chief and if you if you google my name you'll find quite a lot of things that i've written and that's more than enough about me because this panel is not about me this panel is about you so i would say let's start with alberto alberto very warm welcome this is the first time for me that i talk to somebody who really works at cern i've talked to many people who were involved in projects at cern but i'm very proud to have you on this panel so alberto who are you uh, th thank you for this uh, very nice introduction um, it's uh, for me it's also a pleasure to participate in this uh, discussion and uh, so to straight answer your question i am uh, I, I have um, an education as an engineer but uh, uh, what i'm currently doing i am responsible for the storage at cern uh, cern has this uh, large accelerator with uh, um, uh, that is uh, 27 kilometers long and that produce uh, uh, probably 50, 60 petabytes of data every year that needs to be stored in real time. So 56 have... peta petabyte? Yes. So okay. that, that uh, actually there have been years that we really went even far beyond that limit. And we, we expect to reach the exabyte of data within two to three years now. Okay. Uh, the uh, basically, the challenge is to store this data in real time as they come. Uh, but uh, as you can imagine, uh, storing it and putting in a silo, which is which where they are no longer accessible, is would be totally useful, useless. So 
the second challenge is to make them accessible uh, to nearly to a community of physicists worldwide, which is in excess of 30,000 people. So I, I think that there is not a single uh, high energy physics institute in any university in the world, which is currently not working on the LHC data. So there is a massive infrastructure to make this data available and distribute them worldwide. And the other important challenge is that we also need to preserve this data in the long term. So that to ensure that we have a reliable storage and that we don't lose uh, the, the data. So uh, just to come back to, to maybe the, the main core business, uh, as you can imagine, uh, if you would ask for a um, quote uh, from uh, the computing industry to, uh, or to, to the big names of the computing industry to do this service for you, uh, it will cost probably at least one order of magnitude more than uh, the cost of the hardware that you need. And therefore, the open source uh, solution is uh, a clear strategy that has been absolutely unavoidable in order to I would not, in, in order to make sure that the money that is invested uh, for research is really invested in something that has a very high return for uh, the scientific computing. So let me get this right. The cost for the for the software for the setup that you have exceeds the cost for the hardware you said well what i'm saying is that we try to uh, limit the cost to uh, to the cost of the hardware and the cost of the energy needed mm -hmm. to run the 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 hardware and uh, this basically means that we must have um, a scale, you know, a size where the cost of the software that we develop, develop began, you know, is can can be neglected compared to the cost of the hardware. Mm -hmm. And uh, this means that basically we do not have uh, software costs. Mm -hmm. And uh, and this software cost may be very, very high uh, if you don't go for an open source solution. So uh, this is very interesting. So the next Next question is going to, to Holger Dürov. Hi, Holger. And uh, would you please uh, also introduce yourself? But I, I, I would like to give to pass that on as, as kind of a question to you. That is, if, if, if the CERN um, sort of has no software costs, and if OwnCloud is, is, uh, uh, has the CERN as kind of a customer, um, how, how, how does that work? I mean, uh, where, where's the business model? <laughs> So again, this is, I know this is a question that we wanted to discuss much later in this discussion, but we're right into it. <laughs> but sorry, Holger, just a, a small correction. It's not that we have zero cost for software. Okay. But the cost has only a fixed cost. Okay. So we don't have variable costs uh, that are attached to the size. You know, once you have a system that is working uh, in open source, then you can really scale out to mm -hmm. a much bigger size. And then the cost of the software, sorry, the marginal cost of the software uh, is zero. Uh, so that's why you, you, you really need to, 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 have a, uh, to have a minimum size uh, to amortize the cost of the software. Yeah. Yeah, but a, a good start uh, with uh, somewhat a controversy idea here, but um, so I'm Holger Dairoff. I'm one of the managing directors of OwnCloud. I started with open source very early back in 1993 when I was one of the first employees of SUSE and then was one of the founders of OwnCloud in 2012. And um, yeah, I mean, it's a great point and generally something where often there is this misunderstanding that open source means free. I think for Alberto in some ways, um, software costs is a fixed cost because 
his team which is supporting the software is working itself into it. He has quite some developers on stuff and we've seen some throughout uh, this conference doing talks here. So um, he and his team are engaging in the software. They're programming with the software. They can do a lot of the support things maybe on their own. Um, and that's all part of what many other customers will not engage in yeah? because they're not in the business of hiring developers for a particular piece of software. They're really in the business of asking somebody like us to help with that. And then they go for an enterprise subscription and do much less themselves than Alberto and his team would do. Very interesting already. Next one, Cornelius, what do you what do you think when you when you hear that? Does the DB Systel also have uh, a situation where they have like a terabyte uh, that not a terabyte, uh, so 56 petabyte per year, or, uh, what, an exabyte <laughs> per year to be trafficked around Germany? So we, we certainly also have a lot of data, but I think a very different kind of data. <laughs> we are not trying to produce data by letting things collide, uh, but on the contrary, <laughs> we are trying to keep things safe and uh, uh, yeah, bring people safe to, to their destination. Uh, but obviously there, there's a lot of data which, which also is produced there. Um, for me, it's actually very nice this uh, th this round because actually my open source career started in the context of a project at CERN. So I, I worked at the University of Heidelberg um, uh, back then um, on, on uh, the Atlas experiment. I was creating electronics for, for that. And that, that's when a colleague of mine told me about uh, KDE um, when, when the project was brand new. And, and th this, this was when, when I got in touch with open source software for, for the first time. I didn't really understand open source back then. So it was, uh, but I was very happy about the, the wealth of software which was available to, to me. Um, so that, that I was able able to replace our ticker TK application by a cute application. So write some, some uh, interface code there. Um, yeah, that, that, that basically started my, my journey in open source. Um, I, I left the, the university um, uh, then and went into the um, open source industry, although I always consider that uh, more a world, which also includes community and stuff like that. And after producing open source software for, for many, many years, I'm now uh, since two years at DB Syste, um helping the organization to make use of open source in, in a good way and in, of a, in a responsible way. Um, you could describe that as uh, the activities usually you would describe as what, what an open source programs office is doing, although we are not calling it this way. Uh, but it's a very interesting perspective, I think, to see how open source has spread and is used um, a lot. Um, also in our organization, of course, we make a lot of use of open source software, uh, but software is not our business. I mean, our business is uh, uh, bringing people and, and uh, goods from one point to the other. And uh, this is only possible um, if we make effective use of software, um, because that's that's what is driving business these days, right? So from this perspective, I think it's very interesting to uh, have this arc from, uh, yeah, from getting to know uh, what open source is to uh, responsibly and professionally the, making use of it in the enterprise context. Three, three questions. You, 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 you got in contact with KDE because of a CERN project at university or in your in university surroundings, and then you became chairman of the board or something like of the of KDE of the club, right? That's that's really cool. I like that. And um, the other thing is, your what exactly is the Deutsche Bahn or DB Systel? Can you give us two examples what exactly you're doing with open source and with own cloud in particular and at, at DB Systel? So DB Systel is um, uh, the, the digital partner of uh, Deutsche Bahn. So it's part of the Deutsche Bahn group and it's taking care of um, uh, a lot of the <laughs> IT infrastructure, um, also a lot of the software development, which is happening within uh, Deutsche Bahn. So DB Systel is um, more than 5,000 people uh, working on the needs of uh, uh, Deutsche Bahn. And in this context, we, we are making use of a lot of software. I mean, it's it's really a, a zoo of, of um, software uh, <laughs> to do everything we need. Um, we did a massive cloud migration um, in the last uh, few years, um, uh, bringing basically all software we were running in data centers into the, into the cloud. 
Um, and in this context, of course, a lot of the infrastructure, a lot of the software we work with um, is open source, like stuff like Kubernetes and all the cloud native uh, infra infrastructure, uh, but it's really a, a very breadth um, uh, the set of software. So, so that's is, is, is one of the challenges um, I have in this um, situation, but I think which also many other uh, people have uh, working on uh, like the open source guidance uh, within big companies, um, that it's not only about one project. It's not, not about 10 or 100 projects. It's about really um, many, many projects which, which are in use in a different way, in different contexts, either um, directly selected for software development projects, but also indirectly because you get open source software by uh, vendors you buy software from and uh, this includes more and more open source software uh, so sometimes you're surprised when you see the license uh, hints and the <laughs> attributions in software where you didn't expect it mm -hmm. yeah and we have one more uh, person in this round that i that i'm very happy to to be host to that's class freitag he's cto at own cloud and uh, He's also, you've, how many years have you been working with clouds now, Klaus? I guess it must be a decade or more, at least. You, you, I, I, when, I, when, I, when I see you, I think of a, cl a cloud guy. So what are, you, what, what are you doing? What have you been doing? Who are you? <laughs> so yeah, I'm Klaus. Hi. Um, uh, yeah, I started actually with, with cloud like more than 10 years ago. Um, but let me start even earlier with how I started with open source. I mean, Cornelius kind of was stealing my, my story. I, I started actually with open source when I was looking for a free compiler for my diploma thesis. Um, back then there was just, you had to pay for compilers and me as a student, I, I didn't want to spend that money. So I, I ended up with, I think, 20 uh, disk heads back then with, with a GNU compiler on it. And that's how I started and later, um, I got fascinated by that. And, and I remember very well that moment where I saw, I think it was on Heise or somewhere in, in news, there's a new desktop environment for Linux. Um, and this screenshot and this screenshot was so cool that I thought, wow, this is now really a game changer. Now we will we will make it to the desktop of people. So Linux will be now. This is the year of the Linux desktop, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> and I want to be part of that. And I started to to contribute to KDE back then. Um, and even some years later, um, some enthusiasts in the KDE project always were, were continuing to talk more about. Uh, desktop shouldn't happen, on, uh, uh, software shouldn't happen only on the desktop, the cloud becomes more and more important. And how can we uh, transform the idea of privacy and data control from the desktop onto to the cloud environments? And that was actually the, the idea in the very beginning that was behind own cloud. And then I was working for SUSE and, and at SUSE we had this interesting idea of a hack week that was basically a week where the company pays for breakfast and everybody is in a very creative and, and fun mood and um, I my project in this hack week was to investigate on something that looks like a Dropbox client and is going to sync data. Um, and that was when I started to work on the on the own cloud uh, desktop client. And of course, I had no idea how far that can go because the, the next moment that is very remarkably for me is then that I was in CERN for, for one of the conferences and, and Kuba showed me a map on the screen and said, look, this is the world and this every little dot on this on this map shows a desktop client connected to CERN box and syncing data now. And this was the whole world and everywhere were little dots, you know, and this for me, that was really uh, emotional and impressive, you know, and, and also a proof of how far we can go with, with the open source based uh, software and how how quickly you end up in in very important uh, environments with open source and how how important it is. So, yeah, now I am very happy to be the CTO at OwnCloud. Um, we have so many 
interesting challenges and uh, an interesting new product with OSIS, which is really fascinating me. And and so yeah, that's that's me at the moment. <laughs> that's I'm I'm trying to yeah I'm trying to do do a bridge here because you said OSIS and when when we say OSIS, I immediately think of Go, yeah, mm. OSIS and Go and uh, the development la language it has been written in it, and I um. I, I must say I really think that is a very that's a very bold and good move of own cloud to to go to go here that's that's it also the 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 numbers that we I did an article on on osis and also the numbers uh, seem definitely to to justify that decision but as as a CTO how how present is go in in in, in as an uh, language or a developer environment in in companies yet is open is on cloud there something like a, a first mover here or is it um uh, present already i think it's very present so it i wouldn't think on cloud is a is a first mover in the go technology by far not the, the go community is huge it's growing it's very professional there are lots of, of very serious and interesting projects out there written in go um, so no, where we might be uh, one of the first movers is that we are um, trying to ship um, Go microservices-based software as an on-premise solution. Mm -hmm. That is probably not so common uh, still, and it is indeed an interesting challenge that we solve by by um, building this single binary that we have. Um, but in general, I think Go is one of the modern and, and very commonly used uh, languages at the moment mm -hmm. because of the, 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 the benefits that it has uh, over other maybe a bit aged um, development environments. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, because we've mentioned KDE several times now, and I must admit, I'm also using KDE on my um, computers here on my desktops. Um, Alberto and, and Holger, what are what are you? you I, I, so I'm just assuming that Holger and that Holger, that Klaas and uh, Cornelius are using KDE on their computer that they're using right now, and Holger and. Um, and Alberto, what are what are you using in as as your as your private operating system or an, a work environment? No, it's no offense if it's Apple or Windows. That's not a problem at all. It only it only shows how far we've come with open source because we open the open source world can handle everything. It's compatible. But I'm just interested in that, and that might also be interesting for for the listeners. Who wants first, Alberto? Well, I can say that uh, in the Sun community, our users are using everything that exists. So basically, you can name uh, even the most exotic uh, operating system, and we have connections, uh, client connecting from <laughs> really every version of Linux, uh, Mac OS, Windows, uh, all version of Windows, etc. So, and, and this is really a main challenge for, for on cloud to, to have a client software that is very flexible. And in particular, what we really f have found that, uh, you know, one of the strengths is really the value and the quality of the sync clients in platform that are not mainstream. And mm -hmm. uh, very often, it's very easy to find a very solution that works very well on Windows or Mac OS. But as soon as you go to Linux, sometimes you need, uh, you know, you don't have the full capabilities. While with OnCloud, basically, we are, we really can support very effectively uh, the Linux community uh, on the desktop, uh, which very often is really the scientific community. Mm -hmm. That's not the classical setup that you would expect, or that that is to be found in in, comp in companies or enterprise usually, huh, Holger? I guess in, in, when I ask Holger about that, actually in 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 companies, I think you have to to be ready for for Windows and for and support Apple, and uh, Linux desktops probably are not very common in companies anyhow. I guess, and oh, and what are, what are you using? <laughs> You're muted. It depends. Yeah, personally, I'm very flexible. 
I using Linux pretty much since 1997, um, in exclusively including uh, the applications. So yeah, Star Office back then was uh, standard at SUSE as soon as it was available on Linux. Then it did go to Open Office, to LibreOffice, and um, now I'm using mostly Collabora for those type of needs. Um, I started on the email side with Pine and uh, then Thunderbird, and that's something I'm still using. And on uh, the desktop environment side, I switched always back and forth between KDE and GNOME to understand both. And a couple of months ago, because we have more and more to deal with Microsoft integrations on a day-by-day -day basis, including Teams and Office 365 and those type of things, I actually got a new laptop and I uh, stuck with Windows for now, but I have Linux running in a virtual environment, of course, here on the side. But for some of the multimedia things and so, and printing, I was always annoyed of Linux and I stuck this time with Windows, but I have all the open source applications you could think of, which I'm running for a while. So there is not this much of a difference for me in that regards, to be honest. Mm. And in regards of uh, our customers generally, um, we have customers like CERN and other educational institutions where it's roughly one third Linux, one third Mac and one third Windows. So a very, a very heterogeneous environment. That's also like Alberto rightfully says, where we're strong in. We've invested uh, quite some efforts to make sure that we have one client which is running alongside those different devices. Um, of course, these days, mobile actually gets very <laughs> important. So we have a, we, we got a shift of our customers, particularly towards the importance of the iOS platform over time. Um, that's, and iPads particularly is uh, where file exchange and content collaboration is quite important for our customers. However, we also have customers who use the sync client on uh, Linux servers <laughs> in order to transport files to there or from there. Um, so while the normal customers have less Linux usage, they have a heterogeneous usage with Mac mostly, particularly in the United States and in some industries like media. Um, but Overall, I would say all three are equally important for us. Of course, um, from a total user perspective, I would say roughly 80, 85% of the users use it on Windows. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I checked the news in the last weeks and there's, there's lots of news during September from German Behördenspiegel, which is like an, a, a very important portal for um, administrations of the state or of of, or co of cities, and they said um, there's no alternative anymore to open source on uh, the servers, on platforms, on on the cloud. Yeah, then uh, even the Tech Republic says it's time enterprise businesses place their complete trust in open source because can of Canonical's recent decision to go cloud verify to get to achieve the MSP cloud verify certification. Then there is the Bitcom, which is the largest German um, enterprise IT um, lobby group, I would say. And they say without open source, uh, there's nothing going in companies anymore. Ohne, und, ohne open source geht in Unternehmen nichts mehr. That is from 21st of uh, September. That's from, from just one week ago. And so, um, Cornelius, is that true? I mean, the desktop is one thing. The desktop is, is, is one thing, but the Deutsche Bahn without open source, the trains wouldn't go? Um, <laughs> I think that's a fair statement, yeah. Um, without open source, um, nothing will, would, would happen anymore. Um, I think the, the, the diversity of open source projects, of course, is, is big. And uh, uh, it's not only about the desktop, of course. It's about servers. It's about um, um, IoT. It's about infrastructure. It's about um, the, the whole stack everywhere where open source is uh, a growing part of the stack. I think that's also one result of, of this uh, Bitcom uh, survey that, that, that you see that just open source is included in a lot of um, uh, software products. 
and uh, you, you you will get it everywhere. Um, public cloud infrastructure, I think, would not be thinkable without open source. It's, it's running on open source stacks, and uh, the, the this uh, scalability you need, um, the, this is something you only get get with open source. So from from this point of view. Um, it's everywhere and, and you need it to be able to be competitive um, because if, if you try to uh, fulfill the needs we have the the, the challenges we, we face from from digital transformation so so we need a lot more IT we need a, need a lot more software we need we need to uh, uh, put much more into software than, than 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 before to be able to scale and become faster and and uh, deal with the amount of data we have but also with with uh, the amount of passengers in our case we, we want to transport and um, th this only works if if you are using the most um, efficient ways to deal with software. Otherwise, you you wouldn't even have the people to to develop the software. You can't hire enough software developers you, to to develop all the software you you are using. So relying on uh, this this shared commons of of open source as a base, I think, is more or less the only way how how you can face these challenges um, you you have today. And would, uh, yeah, would, would would you say would you say? that the Deutsche Bahn also hits that point that Alberto said before, that that point of size, where the size is as big, that the, that the, the, the marginal cost effect uh, that benefits for open source, that also hits in. Is, is the Deutsche Bahn uh, that, that size where you can really say that's measurable here, that the marginal cost advantage that, that open source had, the scalability here, is, is beneficial to what we do? I think it depends on on the area you look at and in in what kind of perspective you you, you take. Um, in in some areas, of course, this this uh, scalability is very important. So so I think the cloud is actually one one example. I mean, being able to spin up containers, to spin up workloads, um, to to write microservices, have a lot of systems there. I mean that that only works effectively if you don't have to think about. Uh, uh, the, Paying license fees for the operating system to start a new virtual machine. I mean, there, there, uh, open source obviously is a big factor, uh, but. On the other hand, I would also say in the enterprise context, um, uh, what is also very important is that it's not only about license fees, but there, there are also other costs which are very important. I mean, uh, you need to manage uh, software. You need to uh, have support guarantees available to be able to, to operate things uh, responsibly, especially if, if you have uh, critical systems uh, where uh, maybe safety is relying on or just systems which, which are keeping the, the train traffic in Germany alive. I mean, these are systems where where you don't want to take chances that things are breaking because mm -hmm. uh, somebody is patching an open source project and mm -hmm. you don't know what's happening there. So from this point of view, I think the, the cost of operating um, uh, the, the whole infrastructure um, are also a big factor. And I mean, the, there's, there's value in that. So so the, this, this um, I think, also uh, scales. I think the, the scalability effects, um, I would add another aspect of that, I think, for um, especially for innovation, um, I think this uh, low barrier of access to open source software is a big factor. So we see mm -hmm. that in in areas like artificial intelligence or um, the generally machine learning um, or the, be it blockchain or whatever. I mean, they're, they're, whatever you try there, um, there's lots of open source software already available. There's no way, way around of using that. But this also enables uh, doing experiments in a very quick way. So you, you can start with technology um, um, uh, without thinking about uh, negotiating a contract, but you can um, start with the technology. And then, of course, at a, at a point where things get into production, then um, you need to also you build up a more robust framework for that. And you need to make sure that you have vendors who, who are in the background and can actually reliably maintain the software you are using um, unless you're building up the capacity for yourself. But I think that that's always a challenge. Um, so from this point of view, I think it's um, uh, open source is, is is an accelerator in in many ways um, uh, for scalability, for innovation, but also for other things. Class, how so? Cornelius already uh, used the word microservices, which triggers me because I know that, or I think I know that OSIS is one of the core changes in OSIS is also the switch to micro to a microservices architecture. If I'm right, yeah. If I understood that right, so um, how does that um, 
I, I, I guess you are as a CTO, you are the right one to ask that. How does that correlate or how does that go together with what with, with what Cornelius just said? How do microservices and why did you go for the microservices architecture and how does that help in terms of scalability and uh, and uh, all the, all the needs that that Cornelius just uh, told us about, like for example the Deutsche Bahn and the modern enterprise today. Yeah. Okay. I, microservices help in in that regard. Um, if we talk about scaling, obviously, if you design your application in a clever way, um, you gain uh, scalability in a way that you can um, distribute tasks over um, as many uh, computing nodes as you want, uh, if, if, if you want so. So we heard today this in the talk of, of Jörn that we introduced this idea of, of storage uh, spaces. Imagine now we want to uh, have a reverse index over file names and files in of each of, of the whole data set, then we can spin up as many services as we want and let each of them work on one uh, data space separately. And uh, that is exactly how we gain the, the infinite scale that, that we are talking about, right? That is not only a marketing word, but- Now, I get, a, now I get it, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's actually a design principle that, that we can spin up uh, theoretically an, an infinite amount of services working on a certain task um, and I, that's the fascinating uh, idea behind uh, this this microservices architecture another aspect of course is that microservices are playing well in this cloud uh, environment that everybody is talking about and it's giving us a lot of flexibility um, when we talk about deployments in, in, in different environments, in data centers, in Kubernetes, in, in uh, virtual machines and, and all that. So there is a lot of knowledge there today, also a lot of tooling for, from the open source world, obviously how to orchestrate and how to, to automatically manage setups. So, and that's what we wanna um, benefit from. Um, and that must be very important for the, for CERN also, I guess. I see Alberto nodding as 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 uh, class is <laughs> talking. So I guess uh, it, it it is uh, to totally important also, huh? Uh, yes, absolutely. And but uh, you know, just to to follow up on what uh, just class and Cornelius have just said, uh, the the open source really can give you a lot of flexibility to have a very rapid reactions. And it, it really, you really see the value when you have the active development in something that is your core business, which is strategic to you. Uh, because if you use uh, licensed software in areas where, uh, which are very strategic to you, then the time sometimes that are required to have modification installed and deployed and heavily tested can be very, very long. And the open source approach really allows you that to manage completely the, 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 the time to, to, to production. Uh, and of course, you can go very fast and make a mistake and, uh, and then uh, this uh, uh, could be a problem. Uh, but uh, you, you really can decide how much risk you want to take and you have the full flexibility of very, very rapid deployment and the workaround. And in the area of scientific computing, this is essential mm -hmm. in the sense that if you discover that there is maybe a bug in some analysis software or uh, then you, you, you really want to have it fixed immediately because continuing with the old software makes no sense. So you, you immediately deploy and then you, you hope that the problem will disappear. And that, and that's, that 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 leads me directly that's that's wonderful we we were very good in the in the time and that leads me directly to the to the block of um transparency sovereignty sustainability and data protection and security that's a that's a whole block and and i guess um, um that's also something that that holger will be uh, dealing with a lot and my question to holger would be um open source is is one of the key factors to 
what Alberto also just said, that you have the transparency to fix things, but you also have the security that your stuff will will scale in terms of scalability. And um, today, the term has changed a little bit in the in the general public, I guess. Many people don't even talk about open source anymore. It's called digital sovereignty and digital sustainability. Is there, is this, do, am I only perceiving this connection like this and this, this change of wording? Or is this something that you could also, that you also see also at customers, uh, at companies that they are kind of more, more open to, to open source, even though they sometimes maybe don't even understand what were our concepts that started in the 90s? But is that, is that, do you also see this trend? At your at other, for example, also at other customers, we certainly see a trend towards what you name digital sovereignty. I think that is very very clear. And for us, uh, open source is a fundamental part of what digital sovereignty um, means. Um, but now with the naming, there are different ideas there, right? Some people think that digital sovereignty is already um, enough if it completely fulfills the GDPR, the GDPR requirements. That in itself is not sufficient. You need some things more to that. Yeah? We think you need open source to that. We also think um, that it must be um, possible to really run this software wherever you want uh, to have it running. And if you have then if you have the software running at several areas, you should be able to communicate between those instances. We call this federation um, at OwnCloud. Mm -hmm. And so there is some more towards digital sovereignty um, than just being open source and the other way around. And um, there, there is a strong interest in that, absolutely. Um, lots of uh, times coming from regulations and regulations are part of um, the term digital sovereignty, it's an important thing that certain things are regulated, not too many, um, yeah, but some things should be regulated in that area. And that really starts with, with privacy and uh, the uh, general data protection um, regulations we have across uh, the European Union, but which also exists um, in most of the states of the United States in, in the meantime, starting out in California, about two years ago, also exists in, in other countries, uh, like in the Middle East, as, as, as an example, or other regulations which uh, clearly say certain types of data, like your government data, um, needs to stay in country. So in the event of a crisis, we're still able uh, to get to that data and are not hindered by anybody else to get there. Yeah? So that's the combination of this is what we are thinking digital sovereignty looks like. And in the end of the day, an organization or an individual is really able um, to govern um, himself um, and be able to transparently, if he likes, to see what's going on, what exactly is going on. And that's only possible if you have the source code available towards you. And of course, those benefits come on, on, on top of the innovation, acceleration things um, Cornelius and Alberto already named there. Um, how is that? I'm, I'm for small enterprise. What's the benefit of having the source codes available for a small enterprise? I can see that the, the CERN is really benefiting from that. The CERN, who say, which says that we've got every possible client somebody in the chat asked if they are also a temple os or whatever rare <laughs> client but <laughs> i think that's just a kind of a prank but uh the, the question is how does it also help small companies to have open source stuff running i, I think what helps them is that others can look at it i mean yeah. they're, they're never the only ones who can look at this right um if I have open source solutions, there are independent researchers out there. There are many people out there who, for whatever motivation, and if it's about getting a bounty, um, they go into things, they discover things, and that helps helps generally with 
um, security. And even if I'm a small organization, but a piece of software is, is uh, business critical to me um, because it's in one of my products, um, in 10 years from now, if I still have it sitting out there somewhere, I might actually pay somebody to fix things. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And that's um, something, it, it, it might be better for me if I find um, somebody else who does it for several customers who have the same mm -hmm. problem. Yeah, But both things, uh, either the independent offerers or I can do it myself is only possible if there is a source code available and if there is sufficient transparency and if there is some documentation available to do that. So even if I'm smaller, I benefit from that. I, I, I make a su suggestion also. Um, uh, for me, I defined digital sovereignty as um, kind of exit strategy first. So when, whenever I, I, I try to buy a software or to consult somebody to tell him what they should use, I tell them, think about how you get out of it again in the end. Yeah? Because that also leads directly to, to open standards. For example, when you have a new mail server or whatever, how do you get the data out if you want to use a new solution? Yeah? And, and is, that, is that valid or is that, is that just my naive uh, thinking of it? Who wants? <laughs> For me, that is that is a very valid point, and it's an interesting thought model to to approach that problem. Uh, in my opinion, I have uh, seen that again in in the area of small business, where where people and small companies spend an, an comparable big amount of money to for software, and that company just disappeared a short period later, right? And with it, every support and every possibility for the customers to to do something with the software. And yeah, and, and that said, the the idea of thinking how can I get away from it again, um, even <laughs> though that is not what we wish um, mm -hmm. for for OwnCloud, it's an interesting of course. approach. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Albert, Alberto, how do you how do you think? that approach because what would you what uh, yeah what do you think about it well I, I i really agree with what holger has just said that digital sovereignty sometimes is something wider than than just uh, open source uh, he gave several examples and the one i would like uh, to mention which is also very related to on cloud is the access to your own data uh, in the sense that uh, in order to maintain digital sovereignty, you must uh, basically uh, be able to own and modify the software, but you also constantly need access to your own data. And, and this is sometimes uh, one of the risks that, uh, that uh, you may have with uh, uh, going with uh, cloud solutions which of course can really be mitigated in various ways. For example, you can have a multiple contract with multiple providers, so you have multiple copies and could not even be a problem when, uh, when the confidentiality of the data is, is not an issue. Uh, but uh, as soon as you start to have a lot of data, uh, then there is a huge cost and a huge time required to take the data out. And then the, this also, rejoins what Holger said, that there is also the network. So basically the network can really be a barrier uh, that, uh, that basically uh, can make your uh, digital sovereignty vanish because uh, mm -hmm. your, your data can be located in, in, in a location which is no longer accessible for many, many reasons, complete, even completely political. You know, there is, uh, uh, it's in a different country, and uh, there is uh, typically in the United States, and then there is a commercial war or whatever, and uh, you don't have access to your own data. I remember Venezuela had some issue like that not all too long yes. ago. That's a very good yes. example I was thinking of. That that sparked, that gave the, the whole term digital sovereignty a, a big push in, in, in Europe, I think. And uh, uh, how is the, the Deutsche Bahn getting out of their solutions that they chose for their data in the end cornelius <laughs> now do you like the term exit strategy first or is it is it is it naive thinking of a small journalist <laughs> um i don't think it's naive thinking i, I think uh 
exit strategies are a part of every responsible way to deal with uh, any systems, right? I mean, you, you have to think about what, what happens if a vendor goes away? What happens if uh, I can't buy a product anymore? What happens if the solution I've chosen is not maintained anymore? So having an exit strategy, I think, is an important part there. So if you think about it first or, or, or second or third or wherever this position is, I think it's, it's a question of balancing. Um, as, as an individual or a state, you might be in a little bit of a different situation where you put your priorities um, at a business. Um, of course, you, you have to um, set your priorities in a way that, that you can uh, work effectively as a business and, and don't go out of business. So um, and sometimes you might have to take a compromise where maybe uh, the, the value of a service uh, where the exit strategy is more difficult is bigger than, than the advantage you, you, would, you would gain uh, by, mm -hmm. by having a multitude um, of, of options. Um, what, what I think is um, open source adds um, an important factor in, in this whole picture, and I, I would call it resilience in, in your mm -hmm. software ecosystem. Because with open source, you, you get the situation that you have more options, you have uh, more vendors, you have uh, the, the option that other vendors might jump in if a product is not maintained anymore. Um, so so you, you get some re resilience in your choices. And uh, that's, uh, I think, uh, on one hand, of course, an advantage, but it also poses a big challenge uh, because uh, you, you have to choose wisely and you, you have to somehow judge that. And um, if you think of open source as part of all this picture, um, it also brings in risks, um, which you have to consider. So if you think about, uh, I don't know, um, security, and if we think about uh, the long-term sustainability of open source projects, so th these are all questions where I think there are good answers and there are ways how, how to answer them in a good way. Uh, but, but this adds a dimension um, you, you have to consider, uh, which from my point of view makes, makes it um, a very important part that mm -hmm. you develop this competence to deal with open source. I think that, that's the base for everything. Without that, you, you, you won't get uh, sovereignty, you won't get um, uh, sustainability. Um, it's, it's kind of a basic uh, key skill you have to develop as, as a company if you are dealing with software and that's probably um, uh, almost all companies um, and, and the number is mm -hmm. growing. Um, so, so this, I think, is a very important factor which um, you have to develop the skill to deal with open source in a, in a competent way, um, especially if you're a software vendor, but also as, as a software consumer, you have to know about um, open source and how mm -hmm. to deal with that. So this is an area which develops and I think we, we see that in the industry that this competence um, is uh, important um, and at the moment it might still be a differentiating factor that a company which has this competence has an advantage in 10 years it's probably just a given mm -hmm. and nobody can survive without Do, that, that, that 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 would that's perfect that leads to my last question to the or the last round and a question i would ask every one of you do we need more regulation for that should the state should governments should um politi politics get involved here and um, uh, take active steps towards pushing open source and um, in all of its emanations and all of its uh, components with digital sovereignty, digital sustainability. But should do we need more or do we need any kind of regulation that benefits to open source and open source solutions from governments, states, organizations to help it there? Because what I've seen is that in the industry, it has always been stronger kind of in the industry. And the only thing that open source the movement as a movement lacked in the last decades was political support, at least in Germany and many other countries. Should What, what do you think? So I would start with Alberto, then Holger, then Klaas, and then Cornelius for, for an answer to this question about regulations. Alberto. Uh, well, the, the, the regulation is uh, really a very complex uh, part. Um, um, uh, I think uh, Holger already mentioned GDPR, and, and this has been a, a clear step forward. But uh, the, the problem is that very often to protect industry, there is really the fact that the exit strategy is uh, can really, there are really many, many scenarios for exit strategy. And the one on which 
uh, a company is really the most exposed is really when using cloud software, because uh, when uh, you have licensed software and the company goes bankrupt or you have reached a point where you cannot no longer negotiate a license, uh, a license renewal, then you can have one year or two years so that you can find alternative solution, migrate the data, con convert and adapt. But when you have uh, when you are exposed on cloud software and you have a strong disagreement, it's, it can be cut from one day to the other. Uh, and uh, then, uh, you know, whatever you have, you don't have an exit strategy or you don't have the time to implement an exit mm -hmm. strategy. And the case that you mentioned for Venezuela, I think that things happen from one day to another, or in some cases they had the three weeks to, to take out all the data. And the three weeks, uh, when you're talking about a uh, lot of data, uh, it's not even enough to find a sol an alternative solution. So that, that I hear from you that that might be something where regulation could be helpful. Probably not 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 likely, not possible, but it's, helpful if any way. It's could certainly be found. helpful, but it's really the individual responsibility. And the problem is mm. that the regulation can are, are really dependent on the geographical area you are in. Mm -hmm. And when you have contracts which are across the border, already you really see that there is immediate, immediately there is a dispute on which kind of regulation should be applied, if it is the customer regulation or if the seller regulation. Uh, and of course, everyone tries to take the most favorable to him. Mm -hmm. But then in addition, you don't have any kind of uh, jurisdiction that can intervene and uh, guarantee a, a resolution of a possible uh, disagreement. Mm -hmm. oh, Holger, I saw you nodding. Yeah, I, I think on GDPR, however, we don't need regulation, we need enforcement. Yeah, I mm -hmm. think we have a great regulation, but other than on the question of cookie banners, it seems the enforcement is very much lacking uh, behind the regulation. Already two, uh, two times the um, European court had um, to show that uh, data transfers to the United States are, and also to other countries, are not proper. And uh, again, we have um, some politicians uh, and regulators thinking about how can we make it possible instead of enforcing that type of regulation. However, the area, maybe that's a totally different area than digital sovereignty, of course. The area where I think regulation is needed is when it's about software, which is developed on tech, taxpayers' time. So when uh, software is completely uh, developed from the government and a great example in the positive sense is the German Corona Warn app, yeah, which was a, it, it, it was quite costly, uh, maybe could have been done cheaper when given to a larger community, but in any case, um, it is what, to my understanding and my knowledge, the largest government funded open source project. Um, and that's a great example. We need more of those. Yeah, We need government funded. Uh, uh, when government needs software, they should just do that in open source. And that helps everybody, that helps the complete industry. And that's the type of regulation I would uh, be in favor of. Class. Yeah, uh, I wanted to, to, to mention these examples that Holger already now did. Um, I think regulation is maybe not the, the, the right approach. Maybe it's really more about what Cornelius already mentioned. It's more about competence and knowledge. So if I think the, the idea of open source and all the processes that come with it and, and the benefits that are available there will lead automatically to to more open source um, in in this for example public um, mon money spending so what we probably together as as people in this area could together work on is spreading the word even more and trying to convince people trying to explain what it is about and then uh, work on this comp competency build up everywhere and also in politics and we know that in germany probably the politicians are a bit slow on on this new technology so 
<laughs> let's hope that that as time moves forward, uh, we will get them more convinced and then see in, more open source. In, in, in the 80s, there was a great term from political cabaret, I think, or from political comedy came. It was the normative power of the facts. Yes. <laughs> and I really love that. And when I see today that uh, people ask me, Linux, you do, it still happens sometimes that people say, you're doing Linux. That's, that is the operating system that was big in the 90s, but we don't see it much. And I'm telling them, I heard from the, from the head of the automation lab that once you start your car, you already have 20 Linux mini computers, systems, whatever running. And that's even more so if you do a phone call or if you do streaming or whatsoever. So, um, and that's, that leads me to the, the, to the Deutsche Bahn. How many, how many Linux computers, <laughs> I guess it's, it must be simil similar if you do a train ride, I guess. There's a, a whole lot of Linux computers necessary for that also. So it's uh, to pick up Holger's wor uh, and, and, and class words, it's, it's, is, it, is it also more about v visualization, about telling people that it's a, it's an, it's a force that, can't, that, it, that it won't go away, that it's there everywhere, it won't go away? Do, do we, or, or do we need regulation? What do you think? I think we have to make sure that uh, regulation doesn't prevent open source or doesn't put open source at a disadvantage um, in, in an unfair way. So, so that, that's a part of regulation where I would rather uh, maybe remove some regulation or uh, rephrase some regulation. Um, uh, mandating open source, I think, is not a good idea because there are many good reasons why you would use open source and why you are effective with, with open source. So um, I think, yeah, what I said before, what, what I think Klaus also confirmed, uh, this competence of, of dealing um, uh, with that is more important. Um, competence, probably, we, we can't regulate that everybody has to be competent who is dealing with software. <laughs> so we mm -hmm. have to probably work with um, education, with evangelism, and I think with, with showing how um, open source can, can actually successfully um, help us to achieve our goals, be that business-wise, be that uh, with uh, being in control of our data or software. Um, so I think that the, these, these very... Uh, solid advantages um, you have when you're dealing with open source software and when you're developing open source software um, we have to show that to two people and mm -hmm. uh, people will then get it and uh, we have to explain how to deal with that in a competent way and uh, this i think is more effective than trying to regulate things uh, more than and needed I, and, and i think that's wonderful words to to close up to sum up this session also because i think with the three champions of open source that we have had here from as as different as they are with own cloud as a vendor who who supports the, the whole business model with the cern as 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 the I, I can't say it any, any other way as the number one scientific institution on this planet, at least for me personally, it is. And, and with the Deutsche Bahn, which is uh, my favorite uh, means of transportation. And uh, so that's a very personal uh, thing also. I say with champions like that, it should be easy to, to carry on on this path that open source has been on in the last 30 years, I think. And I hope for that. And I want to say a big thank you to all all four of you and uh, thank you for the to, to OwnCloud for giving me the opportunity to to host this panel it was very interesting also for me i took quite some notes that i'm going to do some research on thank you very much time's up we are three minutes over it thank you and have a nice rest of the conference goodbye, goodbye. thank you goodbye thank you bye